Welcome to section three of bacteria. This is our bacteria overview figure, and in this video, we'll be discussing Clostridium difficile, or C. diff, which you can see right here. This scene will take place on a difficult training course for a bunch of army recruits at boot camp. As you can see, many recruits have just gotten off the train and are walking towards the mud where we can see one poor soul crawling through the mud. Looks pretty difficult. Difficult sounds like difficile, and difficile actually means difficult in Spanish. So this should help you remember that this image is all about C. diff. Before we go any further, pay close attention to the sky and the train. Notice all of the blue and purple colors? That's right, just like in other videos, we've colored the image this way to help you remember that this is a gram-positive organism. This is a gram stain of C. diff. Notice that it appears purple under the microscope and it's a rod-shaped. You can see it right here, for example. So C. diff is a gram-positive bacillus. Okay, with this in mind, let's return to the image. As you can see, now we've added some flowers next to all of the mud. The brown mud can be thought of as a symbol for the intestines. So the flowers next to the mud represent that C. diff is part of the normal intestinal flora. So flowers next to mud, normal intestinal flora. Next, notice that we've shown some snails crawling around in the mud next to the flowers. Just like in our Clostridium tetani image, the snails are here to help you remember that C. diff is a spore-forming organism. Remember, snails have an outer shell, just like spores have an outer protective coat. In order to make sure the obstacle course is in pristine condition, the military has hired this guy who's testing the mud with this test tube. He makes sure the mud is extra wet and sticky so that the recruits have a very difficult time getting through the course. Notice that he's being cautious with the mud and even has a mask on. Just like in our other videos, the mask is here to help you remember that C. diff is an obligate anaerobe. Wow, this mud must be toxic or something because this guy seems extremely cautious. Notice that he's even wearing a gown and gloves. This is to help you remember that contact precautions, including non-sterile gloves and a gown, are important in preventing infections. So when you're on the wards in your clinical years, you'll be advised to wear gloves and a gown when entering the room of a patient who has C. diff. Okay, now notice that we've shown a military vehicle along with a guy who's getting ready to clean it. Cleaning sounds like clindamycin, so it will be our symbol for the antibiotic clindamycin. This is here to help you remember that people with prior antibiotic exposure, especially clindamycin, are at an increased risk of developing a C. diff infection. This occurs because if antibiotics are administered, they can kill off healthy intestinal flora. Normally, the intestinal flora has a large percentage of protective organisms, as well as a small percentage of potentially harmful organisms. Therefore, antibiotic administration can disrupt this balance by killing the protective organisms, which can then result in infection from pathogenic organisms such as C. diff. Don't get this confused and think that clindamycin is used to treat C. diff infections. Rather, it increases the risk of C. diff infections. To try and help keep this straight, just think of the guy wringing out his dirty rags into the difficult mud course, making things worse, not better. So clindamycin increases the risk of infection. Okay, let's turn our attention to the right side of the image where we've added this guy on top of the climbing wall. Notice that he's hooked up a pump from the sewer down below and is actively pumping stool onto the course. Hmm, maybe the course isn't mud after all. Poor recruits, that's pretty disgusting. Anyway, the pump here is our symbol for proton pump inhibitors, or PPIs. We've included it in this image to help you remember that patients taking PPIs are at an increased risk of developing C. diff. The pathophysiologic mechanism here is unclear, so I won't speculate, but it is important for you to remember this association. Okay, let's move on and discuss the two toxins associated with C. diff, toxin A and toxin B. Let's begin with toxin A, which is an enterotoxin. To represent this, we've shown a drill sergeant with the letter A on the side of his shirt. The fact that the sergeant is down in the muddy or poopy area with the recruits should help you remember that it's an enterotoxin. Now let's discuss the function of toxin A. Notice that we've shown the sergeant splashing a bucket of poop right into the recruit's face. If we think of the sergeant as a symbol for the toxin, and now he's adding all of this fluid to the muddy, poopy course, then hopefully you can make the connection in your mind that toxin A is associated with increasing intestinal fluid secretion. So toxin A causes intestinal inflammation and fluid secretion. Okay, now let's discuss toxin B, which is a cytotoxin. To represent this, we've shown a drill sergeant with the letter B on the side of his shirt. So drill sergeant with the letter B for toxin B. As you can see, this boot camp is pretty messed up because this drill sergeant is actually shooting one of the recruits with a gun. In other words, he's killing one of the recruits. The recruit can be thought of as a symbol for a cell, and the sergeant is a symbol for toxin B. So this should help you remember that toxin B is cytotoxic and can induce cellular apoptosis. So drill sergeant with a B on his shirt killing a recruit for toxin B can induce cellular apoptosis. 
In reality, both toxin A and toxin B can cause intestinal fluid secretion and apoptosis, but toxin A is more enterotoxic and toxin B is more cytotoxic. However, it is most important that you remember that both toxins can disrupt the cytoskeleton. To help you remember this, we've shown a skull on each drill sergeant, which you can see on their arms. So skull or skeleton for cytoskeleton. So remember, both toxin A and toxin B disrupt the integrity of the cytoskeleton within intestinal mucosal cells. Next, notice that we've included some tires as part of the course. Once the recruits crawl through the poop, they have to quickly hop through the tires and then climb up the wall without getting shot by Sergeant B. The tires are circular and resemble a cell membrane. However, a cell membrane completely surrounds the cell, whereas the tires have large holes in their center, so the circumferential rubber doesn't completely cover them. So I guess you could say that the tires are kind of like a membrane, but not quite. So a pseudomembrane. Therefore, the tires on the ground like this will be our symbol for pseudomembranes. We've included them in this image to help you remember that toxin A and toxin B cause pseudomembranous colitis. Next, the fact that the tires are completely covered in mud should help you remember that toxin A and toxin B also cause diarrhea. So brown watery mud for diarrhea. This is an endoscopic image of a patient with pseudomembranous colitis. Notice that there are a bunch of raised yellow lesions along the colon. For example, right here, right here, and so forth. Hopefully you get the idea. Okay, let's move on to discuss how C. diff is diagnosed. Like I mentioned a second ago, after the recruits crawl through the poop, they have to quickly hop through the tires and then climb up the wall. If you look closely at the wall, you can see that we've shown three chains dangling down from above. The word chain should help you remember polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. So C. diff can be diagnosed using PCR. This is done by obtaining a stool sample, and then the nucleic acid of the organism is amplified, which can detect the gene that encodes for toxin B. To help you remember that the toxin is detected in the stool, we've shown this guy sampling the poopy muddy course. So guy sampling stool for diagnosed with a stool sample. Okay, now let's talk about treatment. Notice that we've shown a big army van truck in the image. Van sounds like vancomycin, so we'll be using it to represent this antibiotic. So C. diff can be treated with oral vancomycin. Also, remember all of those recruits getting off of the metro and walking towards the course? Well, metro sounds like metronidazole, so we've included it in this image to help you remember that C. diff can also be treated with metronidazole. Now notice that we've shown a very fit man holding an axe. Look how fit he appears with his tight shorts, long socks, headband, and tank top on. He's pretty serious. He works alongside the two drill sergeants to ensure that if any recruit messes up, they get beaten with the axe. If you put together the words fit and axe, it sounds like fidaxomycin. So this guy is our symbol for fidaxomycin. So fidaxomycin can also be used to treat C. diff. The fact that this guy is not standing in the mud and not making the muddy course worse should help you remember that fidaxomycin can be used to treat C. diff infections and does not increase the risk of infection like clindamycin and proton pump inhibitors. There's no way he'll want to get his nice new gym clothes all muddy, so he's off to the side of the course away from the mud. Finally, notice that we've added this guy to the scene who is planting a flower in the mud. He actually picked it out of the ground from that group of yellow flowers behind him and is now transplanting it a few feet away. The transplanted flower is here to help you remember that a fecal microbiota transplant may be considered in recurrent cases. The logic behind this is that the introduction of new intestinal flora may promote the ability of healthy organisms to fight off pathogenic C. diff organisms. So transplanted flower for fecal microbiota transplant. Okay, now that we've covered the image, let's review with a question. A 73-year-old female is brought to the emergency department due to fevers, nausea, vomiting, and flank pain. Physical examination reveals costovertebral angle tenderness. After thorough evaluation, she is treated with levofloxacin for pyelonephritis. Several days later, her symptoms begin to resolve, but she develops watery diarrhea and abdominal pain. Nucleic acid amplification testing of the patient's stool reveals the presence of the TCDB gene, which encodes for a toxin produced by a gram-positive organism. Which of the following is most likely true regarding the toxin? A. It activates adenylate cyclase. B, it inactivates the 60S ribosomal subunit. C, it disrupts the integrity of the cytoskeleton. Or D, it cleaves snare proteins. Okay, hopefully from the question stem, you notice that this patient was treated with the antibiotic levofloxacin and then several days later developed watery diarrhea and abdominal pain. This is suggestive of a C. diff infection. Recall that antibiotic exposure is a major risk factor for C. diff infections, not just clindamycin, but antibiotics in general. 
Clindamycin is certainly the most classic example of this, but always be suspicious about a C. diff infection if a patient is treated with an antibiotic and then develops diarrhea. The question stem also states that nucleic acid amplification testing, which is just a fancy way of saying PCR, revealed the presence of a gene that encodes for a toxin, which is produced by a gram-positive organism. Therefore, we can conclude that the watery diarrhea and abdominal pain are being caused by a microorganism, which is most likely C. diff. Okay, with this in mind, we're asked about the toxin. So the correct answer is C. It disrupts the integrity of the cytoskeleton. From the image, recall that the skull on the arms of the drill sergeants right here is here to help you remember that toxin A and toxin B both disrupt the integrity of the cytoskeleton. A is incorrect because this is describing the mechanism of other microorganisms, such as Vibrio cholerae, Enterotoxigenic E. coli, and Bacillus anthracis. These organisms may cause diarrhea, However, they're unlikely to suddenly cause symptoms in a patient who was recently treated with an antibiotic, so A is incorrect. B is also incorrect. This is describing the mechanism of the toxin produced by Shigella and Enterohemorrhagic E. coli. These are more likely to cause bloody diarrhea and are unlikely considering that the patient was recently exposed to antibiotics, so B is incorrect. Finally, D is incorrect because this is describing the toxin produced by Clostridium tetani and Clostridium botulinum. If you watched the last two videos, then you should know that these are classically associated with muscle spasms or paralysis, not diarrhea. So D is incorrect. So again, the correct answer is C. It disrupts the integrity of the cytoskeleton. And with that, we've covered everything you need to know about C. diff.